Thank you very much. It's my honor and privilege to speak uh, in this distinguished forum. So today I'd like to share with you some of the work that we have been doing here. So it's my Declaration of Conflict of Interest. So my primary area of research is prenatal diagnostics, which for many years has been dominated by invasive techniques like amniocentesis. And every time we stick a needle into the uterus of a pregnant mother, we have a risk of actually harming or even killing the baby. And because of this reason, for the last 20 years, I've been dreaming about the possibility of developing a non-invasive test in which we can just take a drop of mother's blood and be able to tell about the genetic well-being of the baby. So in 1997, I was thinking that maybe it's possible that a fetus within the body of mother might release its DNA into the bloodstream of the mother. And so I thought that if the baby is a boy, maybe we'll start to see Y chromosome sequences in the blood of the mother. And so I do experiment like that, in which you see in an arrow, we can see some white signals over there, which in the blood of some pregnant woman and absent others. And eventually, I find that those women with that white signals all have baby boys, and the other one all have baby girls. So this is the first discovery of fetal DNA in blood plasma on the mother. And so we thought that this would be a very exciting diagnostic opportunity. And we know actually that this DNA entered the mother's blood very early on, like the seven weeks. And actually by the 10 weeks of pregnancy, it actually reached 15%, which is amazing because imagine the baby is so small and mother is so large. And also, after the baby is born, within two hours, this DNA is gone. So we're thinking, okay, how can we use it diagnostically? And we think that the number one reason why women, pregnant women, go for prenatal testing is because they're worried the baby might have Down syndrome, which is caused by abnormal number of chromosomes. So we try to actually develop it into a non-invasive test for Down syndrome. And actually, it's quite difficult because the DNA is swimming outside cells, so we cannot count how many chromosomes within the cells it has. And also, this DNA from baby and the mother mix in together. So in the, in the end, it actually took us 10 years from 97 onwards to actually develop this technology, which we first report in 2008, in which we basically sequence millions of DNA molecules in the blood. And then we map each of those sequences to the chromosome from it it come from. And then at the bottom, we can then calculate the ratio of different chromosomes in plasma. And interestingly, when we actually test this in the first large scale trial, which we finished in 2011, the accuracy is actually 99.7%, which is surprisingly high. And actually this test, uh, study have now been replicated by many other groups. So we were very eager to actually transfer this commercially into an actual diagnostic test. And of course, we couldn't do it unless we actually have uh, patent protection. So for the last 20 years, we've been very diligently actually filing uh, patents to protect this area. And actually this year, in this authoritative magazine called Nature Biotechnology, they have selected what they regard as the top 20 translational research groups in the world. And I'm very pleased to report to you that actually my group here in Hong Kong is actually in the top five. And actually in this group, there's actually some very distinguished company. Like on the third here is Bert Vogelstein, who is a world-renowned cancer researcher from Johns Hopkins. And number six is uh, Jiang Feng, who is actually one of the inventors of this CRISPR technology for genome editing. And the bottom here, Shina Yamanaka, is the 2012 Nobel Prize uh, winner for inventing the induced pluripotent stem cells. So anyway, so we have accumulated this IP portfolio, which we have actually have licensed to Illumina and Sequinom, and they have actually sub-licensed to about 50 other companies. And also in Hong Kong, I was actually started my own uh, startup company called Exelom, which stands for Extracellular Genome. And actually, the Chinese for Exelom is called Nga Si Lang. And actually, Nga Si in Chinese means scholar. Okay, so it means that even scholar can do it. And, and actually, uh, since then, we have actually exited uh, Exelon, but actually before we exited, Exelon has about 60% of market share of this uh, test in Hong Kong. And so now, this technology has been around for about seven years. It's actually now available in over 90 countries, and millions of tests are done every year. Now, for example, in mainland China, every year, about 4 million of these tests are done. So this sort of test is called NIPT, non-invasive prenatal test. And of course, we're still worried that, for example, if this test is only available through the private market, 
then maybe some of us might not be able to afford it. So because of this, in collaboration with the Hospital Authority of Hong Kong, which look after 43 public hospitals in Hong Kong, we have actually transferred the technology to them. So actually from early next year, this test will be available free of charge to the highest risk pregnant women in Hong Kong. And they will actually put this test in this very nice hospital called the Hong Kong Children's Hospital, which took about uh, 13 billion Hong Kong dollars to build. So Dave, uh, before I finish, I'd like to just share with you some of my personal thought about the competitive landscape in Hong Kong in this area. So I think one of the key strengths we have is that in a relatively small city of 7.5 million people, we actually have a number of uh, quite top universities. For example, according to the Times, High Education Supplement, within the top 100 universities in the world, we have actually three of those. And also, if you look at the academic in Hong Kong, we have actually our fair share of members of different national academies. And then also, as I mentioned, the two medical schools here actually have a very close collaboration with the hospital authority. Now, for example, in my own personal experience, our commercialization of Down syndrome tests would not be so smooth if we had not have the collaboration of our colleagues at the hospital authority. And also, for the last 20 years since I've been here, I've actually seen that the research and development funding actually exponentially rises. Now, for example, for my first project in Hong Kong, which started in 97, I was funded around 600,000 Hong Kong dollars, which is a very small sum of money. But nowadays, we actually have some very large grant to the tune of like 80 million Hong Kong dollars. So I'm very encouraged to hear the chief executive of Hong Kong uh, pledging that she would actually double the R&D expenditure in Hong Kong for the next uh, five years from now. And also, if you look at research and development infrastructure, we actually have seen a lot of good developments, like the Hong Kong Science and Technology Park, which wasn't there when I was, first came back to Hong Kong. And also recently, I heard the government is actually going to invest 10 billion Hong Kong dollars to develop two innovation clusters. And one of those is in healthcare, which we hope to have the opportunity to participate. And of course, uh, all of us know that Hong Kong is renowned for us for its legal system. But however, actually during my experience here, when we commercialize this test, we actually have experience with litigating patterns in our courts. And in this regard, we actually find that very, very few people actually have ever litigated patents in Hong Kong. And so as a result, our courts and our lawyers are really do not have a lot of experience. So I think this is an area which Hong Kong would urgently need to enhance if we were eventually to become a research and development hub. And of course, I mean, even though we know that Hong Kong is very densely populated, but still 7.5 million people is quite small to develop a world-class biotechnology company. And actually, we find, for example, even though one of my companies have, let's say, 60% of market share in Hong Kong, but that's it. You, it's very difficult for us to actually expand the mainland because genetic testing is an area which is very heavily regulated, and also there are very strict laws for exportation of samples. So we basically cannot access that market. So I hope that with this Greater Bay concept, I hope that eventually, maybe this sort of uh, DNA samples will become freely transportable within this area to allow us to really access that market of, say, 70, 75 uh, million people. And also, for the last 20 years, I actually see that is a really an, a, a sea change in the keenness in which we would do innovation in Hong Kong. For example, like 20 years ago, when I first came back, when we invented something, the natural cost of event is to license it to other companies. But now, actually more and more professors here are actually starting their own companies. So I think this is really a very exciting juncture. And so I really hope that actually Hong Kong is really on its way up in the research and development field. And so the next few years is going to be critical. And a lot of interesting things is going to happen. So thank you very much for your time.